I'm Janice Edwards. Coming up on today's Bay Area Vista, we're having the conversation that every family should, but sometimes puts off. What do you do when you discover that your grandparents or parents can't care for themselves anymore and you have to make decisions for the rest of their lives? Carolyn Brent's father was her hero and her best friend for years, but great love wasn't enough to prepare her to become his caregiver. Her book, Why Wait, delves into areas we all need to discuss. So that's coming up next on Bay Area Vista. Join us. And this is Bay Area Vista. Thank you for joining us. If you're a caregiver to a parent or a grandparent or to a spouse and you find yourself neglecting your own care, today's show is for you. If you're a parent who realizes it's time to have a tough talk with your adult children about your future, or you found yourself in a family feud that's far from funny because of fights with your siblings or other relatives about the care of a parent, this show is for you. If you hate to think about the fact that one day you'll have to prepare for a parent's death, you don't know where to begin tackling the emotional, financial, and legal issues, then get ready to take some notes today. That's what this show is about. Carolyn Brent is the author of Why Wait? The Baby Boomer's Guide to Preparing Emotionally, Financially, and Legally for a Parent's Death. In 2009, Carolyn founded her business, Grandpa's Dream, and the nonprofit organization Caregiver Story to effect positive change for families experiencing pain and challenges associated with their parents' medical, financial, and legal well being. For 17 years, she worked for some of the world's leading pharmaceutical companies, including serving as a clinical education manager for Pharmacia and a senior therapeutic sales representative in the pharmaceutical industry. Now, for the last four years, she's volunteered her services to Congress, working toward making the Veterans Administration administration responsible for upholding the decisions that veterans have made about the appointment of a financial fiduciary and medical representative in the event of their disability. We have a lot to cover today. 13 million baby boomers across the nation are dealing with this to one degree or another. So Carolyn, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm very honored to be here. Yes, yes. well I'm glad to have you and I have to say that I am glad that you wrote this book because in the 16 years of my mother's illness preceding her death yes. recently, people said you should write a book mm -hmm. about these things. It's tough to talk about. You Absolutely. have such vital information. So let's go a little bit into your story of what led you to writing about these issues that people okay. don't like to think about but need to talk about. Absolutely. Well, basically back in 1997, I discovered as a clinical education manager, I was traveling back and forth from California to Colorado visiting dad. On one particular trip I had gone to visit my father, I noticed he had lost like 30 pounds. And as a result of dad losing that much weight, I immediately had taken him to the Veterans Administration Hospital to get him evaluated. And the doctor looked at me and he said, wow, I'm so glad that you are the caregiver caring for your father. And I was shocked like, no, I'm visiting my dad. I'm not a caregiver. I'm just his daughter taking care of him. Because in my head, I thought a caregiver was like somebody that wore a smock, that worked in a hospital. But I then recognized I was my father's caregiver. So his hemoglobins were so low, the doctor had shared with me that dad could have possibly died. And I thought right then and there, I said, something is not right with my father. And I started... Uh, f traveling back and forth more and more and come to find out dad had flooded his basement at one time. Uh, one time he had gotten into a car accident and he totally freaked out this man, I called him my hero, the, the man that was never afraid of anything, didn't want to go to court. And that's when I had him further evaluated and found that dad was in the early stages of dementia. Yes, which is just a shocking yeah. discovery and so many of us deal with those things and it, this is one of the reasons that I wanted to disclose what I did is because even as we're talking about it and grappling with it those memories of discovering that things are not the same Absolutely. a lot of times people are going home for a holiday or vacation like you you just yeah. came for a visit you're thinking okay I'll see dad and everything changes there's a seismic shift Absolutely. when a child or a grandchild becomes a caregiver Absolutely. and so that's one of the things that you talk about in there as you became your father's yeah. caregiver and had to look out for his medical well-being. There are a lot of other things. It's like a Pandora's box Absolutely. that gets open. So let's talk a little bit about further 
down the journey some of the things you had to deal with? Well, first of all, my father was very resistant to even moving. I said, Dad, I cannot travel back and forth from, Col to, from uh, California to Colorado on a bi-weekly basis. It's virtually impossible, plus being a single woman working in, in the pharmaceutical industry, traveling around the country, I said, Dad, it will be best for you to come and live with me in California. So two years later, after you know him flooding the basement several times by just keeping the water on, I don't know how he would do this, but well, because uh, they forget what they're doing, they and totally, the water's just running. Then they look up and say, "Well, absolutely, how did this happen? absolutely." Yeah. And then going there and looking in his refrigerator, there was food that had mold and all kind of stuff. Bills stacked up high where he wasn't paying his bills and. I knew something was wrong with dad. My dad that was a meticulous dresser all of a sudden became the type of dresser he was wearing the same clothing all the time and he wasn't taking a bath. Mm -hmm. So dad was smelling uh, the urine on him. I, I'm going like, this is not my father. So when dad moved to California, I was able to watch him on a literally a, da a daily basis and I thought, He's not, I'm in denial at this point, thinking that, okay, let's slow down the, the uh, aging process as far as dementia. The more I get dad medication, he's gonna get better. I'm always thinking he's gonna get better. He can't possibly get worse. But I, the more I studied about dementia, I knew that it was going to get worse and never better. But the doctors and the, at that time there was only one medication out, it helped to slow down the process Probably a Aricept bit. at that time. It right. was Aricept, that was the only thing. Right. And that was all I had to work with and I just hoped and I prayed and I worked hard and you know I started paying people to help me in my home until it got to the point one day and me being in denial and I tell everyone, whatever you do, take away the keys if, they, if your yes. parents are gonna fight you. Because one day I was in my home office doing my work, my father poked his head in the window uh, the office door and said, Carolyn, I'm going to go to the store and get something sweet to eat. And I'm thinking, okay, going two blocks away, what kind of damage is that going to do? Mm -hmm. Being in denial, I still was. I'm thinking, Aricep was going to help Dad. Not only did Dad uh, go to the store, I did not see Dad for 24 hours. Yes. And I had to call. I ran to the store when the, the more, you know, it started getting dark. I started getting nervous. I went to the store. I, I looked at every parked car in the parking lot, ran in the store looking for my dad. Dad wasn't there and I was panicked. Yes, of course. And I can't even, t I can't even begin to tell you the stress I was going through because I started feeling guilty because I had not taken away the keys. And I knew that dad had a little memory loss. I didn't know the severity. So I ended up calling uh, the highway state patrol. I ended up calling the the police and nowadays is called the uh, a, a golden alert or silver alert which is like the amber alert the, the whole state will start looking for your loved one and uh, I got a phone call from a car dealership in Sacramento California at that time I was like 90 miles away from Sacramento where I was living and uh, the lady said is your name Carolyn Brent and I said yes well your dad I just left the car dealership. He's looking for your house, and we thought that we would ask him for your phone number because he looked a little disoriented. He had urinated on himself, uh, you know, apparently, yeah. and we were really concerned. I said, stop him. Don't let him go. Please hold my dad. And she said, I'm sorry he left uh, five minutes ago. And I said, please run to the parking lot. I'm just, like, stressed, yes. like, go get my dad. And she ran to the parking lot. Dad wasn't there. I got in my car, drove all the way to Sacramento. By the time I reached the, uh, the car dealership, they were closed. Oh, so what gosh. I did, I decided I'm going to find my father. So I'm driving up and down the freeways of, of uh, oh. Sacramento looking for my dad, stopping at every 7-Eleven station, every gas station to find my father. And what can I say? I never found my dad. Oh, my gosh. So what eventually happened? Uh, a very dear friend of mine, she's 20 years older, fell dot in Los Angeles. She said, Carolyn, go home because if your father's going to call you, at that time, I, he didn't have a, a cell phone. Dad would never use one anyway. Right. She said, go home because if he calls, he needs to be able to get in contact with you. I went home. I waited for my father. And uh, 2 o'clock in the morning, I get a phone call. Is dad on the phone? 
and I'm so thankful to God. I'm just like, oh, dear God, thank you. Here is my father. And I said, Dad, where are you? And he said, just a minute, clink. The phone hung up, and I panicked even more. Yeah. But I don't know how the uh, the uh, sheriff's department was able to trace that call. But they called me five minutes later and said, "We have your father." And I was very thankful. I said, "Where is he? He's 250 miles away in Yuba City, California. That's where my dad was looking for my house." Oh my and that's when I had to realize I had to accept the fact because I was in denial. I would not believe it. I was thinking I could bargain with dad, with his behavior, yeah. by giving the, him, him the keys, letting him go two blocks away. And that's when I realized I needed professional help. I needed the professionals to intervene and help me with my father. And I was told that if I did not get 24 hour help from my father, next time I may not be as lucky yes. to get him back. And those were the words from the sheriff's department. Yes. and and. People, some people hearing your story will think, well, wow, that is incredible, and it's as frightening as it is. So many of us have stories. I'll share a little bit of one, too, because yeah. what, we, what we're hoping for today is that if you're dealing with this or think you might yeah. be encountering this from either yeah. side, maybe a parent who's starting to have some concerns, or as I said, uh, at whatever place in this show this touches your life, it's important to discuss it. My mom decided to go for a walk. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. a friend of hers that died, she was in assisted living at the time. I was there every day, would spend the night and everything. All of a sudden they said, oh, well, she, they did the med round. She yeah. wasn't there. I was literally in the rain chasing buses because oh, she had been on I, foot yeah. all night till four in the morning. I know. Heart and, you know, heart and hand. I just Absolutely. hit the microphone. The director's probably upset. But it's just, it, 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 it terrifies you. Absolutely. And the sheriffs found her and thank goodness no one had harmed her. Right. But uh, again, the denial, yeah. the sense that has yeah. to be recognized that it's not like even though your parent become even <clears throat> though you become parent to your parent it's not like with a child where you think okay they're past this developmental stage yeah. they'll get better we're looking forward to their future absolutely what you're looking at ultimately with the future of a parent who's in decline right. is death and absolutely. none of us want to face that absolutely so that's the thing that is so challenging and that's one of the things that you do in the book is talk about the key considerations once you realize that a parent can't live alone. You talk right. about how to how to choose if you can't have your parent in the home, which is a heartbreaking yeah. decision at times, but sometimes you realize if you're yeah. working that an environment, a loving environment, a board and care is what yeah. Yeah. I found for my mom after looking at 14 places. Oh yeah, absolutely. Was one of the choices. Yeah. But what do you recommend that people who are facing that look for when they, if they have to make that hard decision? Well, first of all, I always say try to make caregiving a family affair if you have siblings, if you have siblings. If you do not have siblings, try to have extended family, like best friends or anyone involved. So what I did with dad, I started in, the, in, in my home care. It's as someone coming to the home yeah, and the that's person- Yeah, I started will, too. Yeah, mm -hmm. that, I mean, it's like you have to just kind of like a step up right. uh, type of deal. But the person would come into my home and take my father to senior adult day treatment so dad would have his outings uh, during the day, and that lasted all of maybe maybe six or seven months. Mm -hmm. Because to get someone to come into the home, that's another paradigm that people don't realize. It's not easy. And it's you very expensive. It's very expensive. You have to really trust the people that come into your home. In my case, I mean, I was buying $200 worth of food per week for my dad. Now, where is this food going? Things like that, you just ha constantly have to stay on top of it. But what the reason why I couldn't keep my dad in the home anymore, it's like how can a person afford to have someone to come into the home 24 hours a day? It's it's very, very expensive. Yes, so and, and a lot of it is not covered because it's considered non-custodial care if someone has dementia. It's not technically classified absolutely. as an illness absolutely. when dealing with that. And one of the things I want to mention yeah. for people who are just learning this language, when we talk about adult day health care, those are centers where you can, where a parent or a loved one can go, because sometimes it's a younger person who's yeah. had a stroke or something, right. where medications are given, they have social interaction, and they have an opportunity 
opportunity to feel like they're still connected in the world and they don't feel strange. It's, it's just like where there are camps for people with certain Absolutely. illnesses. Here people are together and for one yeah. reason or another they need some supervision in the day so that yeah. if a diaper needs changing Absolutely. or whatever, someone's there to Absolutely. make sure that they have comfort and companionship and the loneliness that they face right. as they realize that their faculties are diminishing is, is heartrending and so having that kind of support makes a big difference. It, I tell you that the uh, day treatment for me, it was a lifesaver because I knew that was uh, being mentally stimulated on a daily basis. And my father was a pastor and he loved people around him. So dad mm. would think that he was at church yes. and he would give, you know, like he would start preaching and, you know, <laughs> singing. And it, dad became like the person that everybody grew to love at the senior ad adult day treatment. And dad was part of that senior adult day treatment for about six years. And I'm wow. very, I was very honored to have that. But uh, uh, once my father really got, I mean, once again, you talked about how with children, uh, children, they're getting stronger every day. You could teach them something, they're getting better, they're walking straighter, uh, they're smarter, the whole bit. With a parent that their, their illness is ailing, the best is that day that you have. That yes. is the best day because you don't know what tomorrow's going to bring. And nothing prepares you for the fact that one day they won't be able to write their own name. Absolutely. Or even speak, perhaps, depending on Absolutely. what else they're dealing with. Absolutely. And then you'll start seeing them walk more slumped over day to day. It started breaking my heart when Dad got on a cane, but he needed a cane. And I became his cane because he would hold onto my arm mm -hmm. as we both went to church every Sunday. The whole time I had Dad, I would take him to church with me because he was a pastor, and that was a, a huge connection for him to go and praise God on Sundays. He yes. absolutely loved and it. And rituals are important. And one of the things that as family members are grappling with this that mm -hmm. they can look at is how do we continue some things that are of value and at the same time consider the caregivers because a lot of people are a sandwich generation or sometimes it's a young person right. suddenly caring for a grandparent. Right. And how do you maintain your own life at the same time. And that's that's part of the challenge. Boy. You started meditating at one point, and or I, was that later? I, I started me meditating after I went through the whole caregiving uh, oh. process. Mm -hmm. I was so into taking care of my dad, and I really didn't f have the resources avail available to me. I had broken my fifth metatarsal on my foot, which is the fifth right. bone on my, on my left foot. And when the doctor, I didn't realize I had broken my foot. And then one day my foot had turned completely purple and I decided, I think I better go to the doctor's office and find oh out. Gosh. And when my doctor said, Caroline, you have a broken foot, I was still in denial. I said, I cannot take off work. Put the cast on, I've got to go to work, I've got to hit my sales numbers because the president of the company had made a, uh, an announcement that if you don't hit your numbers, you're losing your job. So with assistant living, I was looking at $6,500 a month to pay my dad's uh, room and board for a tiny little cubicle, and that is cash out of pocket. It's not, yes. you know, Medicare or Medicaid or any public assistance, and that's what people have to realize. Assistant living is not free, it costs. Yes. So if you don't have long-term care, which I advise people to get long-term care, get something that's gonna help you defer that cost. All right, and let me just break that down on sort of a one-on-one. -on -one. So long-term health care means that for someone from 30 on up, as part of a lot of plans that if you work for someone, they offer it. And yes. at a certain age, it it's, can be considered yeah. a great investment because that will help defray some of the costs. It may not cover all of it, but I think it may be $200 a day, which is at 6000 something a month. That's Absolutely. about what yeah. you were paying. And, yes. and it is it is a shock because yeah. in the midst of dealing with the emotional loss and the medical concerns, then the care is another one. One of the things that's important to when you're looking at a place, there are books that will tell if that's that facility or boarding care or nursing home has a record of abuse or neglect, Absolutely. you should also go at different times of the day or night to oh. find out if you smell urine or Absolutely. if someone's crying and being ignored. What else did you look out for before you chose a place for your father? Well, <clears throat> what I did, well, this is what I learned afterwards. There's a, it's, I kind of went the, uh, backwards with it. 
Uh, my dad and I both had looked at cer uh, certain places, and I looked at the cleanliness. I looked at, you know, what do they have to offer uh, as far as like programs within the facility? Activities. Absolutely, mm -hmm. activities is key. Do they have like a person that will come and clean uh, cleaning service? You know, what type of mills? Could, do they have special programs for mills? So I looked for everything, but there was one thing I forgot to ask because I didn't know to ask, which I like to share with everyone. I did not ask. With, with the uh, when I first put dad in was his uh, medication included and what I'm oh, talking about yes. included my father was a veteran he got his medication for free from the Veterans Administration so the only thing I had to do was to give the facility the medication to give to my dad dad only had five medications that he had to take on a daily basis which isn't that much when I first went to the facility they said it's all-inclusive uh, give us your, you know, your, your, we're, we're going to take care of your dad, we'll give him his medication. But then six months later, the place changed hands and it went to a totally different ownership. They did not uh, get grandfather the contract in no. and they wanted to charge $100 per pill on a medication that I'm providing. I had to fight that. I fought it and I fought it. I and also that was just to administer it to him, $100 to give him one pill a day. Could have been an aspirin. Yeah. Abs absolutely. Mm -hmm. Another thing that I share in my book that I had to fight as well, uh, uh, as far as like how often do they change staff members? Mm -hmm. It got to the point, you know, there was a different person on duty all the time. And I'm going like, this is confusing for my father. He wants to know where Sally J Jane is. And then he's getting Jane Doe and all these different and people. And confusing for you too, because you want to know how he's doing <clears throat> at different times. Absolutely. And you want that continuity of someone who has a sense about him. Absolutely. And keep in mind, I was paying $6,500 a month for just to keep going through this barrage of circles. But another key thing that happened to me that I was not aware of, that's why I wrote the book, my father had an unexpected uh, emergency surgery, and dad had lived in a facility for five years. Once dad had left the, the facility to go to the hospital, he had his rehab, by the time I had taken dad back to his assistant living, they evicted him. And I had my father in the car with no place to go. Because you have to reserve a bed and pay if it's past seven days, and that's something that they often don't tell you, and you're finding all these things out, which is wonderful, like I said, that you wrote that, because every time you do this, not only are you dealing with all of those situations with your parent, but then you're looking at making your quota numbers at work, Absol and also oh, all of, and, and everyone's dealing with those same pressures <clears throat> and feeling like they can't say to their boss one more time, I need to take off work for Absolutely. my parent Absolutely. without losing a job. <clears throat> Did you have, were, was there some understanding at some point regarding your professional needs as your father's condition deteriorated? Uh, in regards to my in company? In, in regards to your work in your company? Uh, well, my company, first of all, they did not care because mm -hmm. it's all about numbers. And I, I hate to say that, but that's the truth. Well, that's true with a lot of places, unfortunately. <clears throat> yes. And also, there's what is known as the Family Medical Leave Act. Now, that's fine and dandy. Companies will accept that. But what happens when you go back to the company? In my case, I still would have lost my job because everything is based on numbers. Mm -hmm. So that is why I, I really, really stress that caregiving is a family affair if there is, if, you know, if, there, if a person has a family. Now, if the family decides that they don't want to work together, I have which found, often happens. Yeah. There are horror <laughs> stories about that. Oh, yes. I, I have a, a horror story, which I'm not going to share, but I will share this. Because of what I went through, I started doing research, and I discovered a woman by the name, uh, in San, she lives in uh, San Rafael. Her practice is there. Her name is Carolyn Rosenblatt. She is an elder law attorney slash mediator, sibling rivalry uh, negotiator. Wow. I'd never heard of that. So wow. the more I researched her, I had found that she had uh, known about her. She has, it's called a sibling contract law. And I'm thinking, what is a sibling contract? So I called her up and she said, yes, when there's one person that is the caregiver and the other family members decide, I don't want to get involved. You take care of mom and dad because I'm too busy. You're doing a good job. And then at the end of that person's life, the family decides, oh, we want to take over now. We want to get want to share of the money that's left <laughs> many times if there's life insurance, and that's part of it. Absolutely. But, you know, there are so many tips. It's, it's amazing because yeah. we just started this conversation. We're almost out of time oh, for the show. So yeah. when uh, with the little time we have yeah. left, literally about a minute for yeah. you to say, 
one thing that someone needs to just understand? I know one would be get out of denial, but something else that you can leave our audience with today to help them as they start these very difficult but important conversations. The one thing that I always tell a person, yesterday is too late. Now is the time to put everything you want in writing. If you're a baby boomer, if you're a traditionalist, if you are a Generation Y or Generation X, the bottom line, you have to take the responsibility for who you want to take care of you if you have a sudden unexpected emergency. And that's what I would uh, share with everyone. That is critical yeah. information. Yeah. And you have so many more details. Again, the book we want to put yeah. on the screen again is Why Wait? It's the Baby Boomer's Guide. Thank you. And then also you have your website, which is thecaregiverstory.com, and that has details as well. So, yes. thank Carolyn, you. thank you for this because it does make a big difference. Things I wish I'd known, things that you wish you'd known, yeah. but hopefully will help others. Thank so thank you, you so again. Much. Thank you so much. Yes. And thank you for joining us. Hope that you got some information that will help you in planning. And that's our show. I'm Janice Edwards. And thank you for all that you do to make our Bay Area the great place that it is. Please join us again next time. We look forward to seeing you then. And for details about anything on today's show, BayAreaVista.com.